So at our last meeting, we went over the 2007 comprehensive plan section related to heritage preservation. And we had a lot of great discussion and comments. I was just reviewing the video and we only got through, I mean, the first 30 minutes were just the first two items, which really covered actually, fortunately, a lot of the rest of it. Uh, so I appreciate all of your comments and the thoroughness with which we were going through that. Today, I do want to look at kind of the ongoing efforts that the city has toward preservation. And so I said I included in the calendar invite the 2023 HPC priority list discussion. And I want to talk about how that is generated, what it means in terms of ongoing work for preservation in the city of Winona. And then I really want to start talking about what fits with our discussion over the last two meetings and what's missing, because I can think of a few items that are missing already, and I'm going to steer you toward them if we have to, but I, I want to hear from you initially. So up on the screens, we're going to go ahead and pull up that priority list. And here we'll see a list of eligibility determinations needed, National Register of Historic Places nominations needed, surveys that are needed, local designations that are being considered, other projects that are needed, and then current projects. And this is primarily generated based on a document. I'm going to stop sharing and switch over to a different document based on a document that we call our Winona Historic Inventory. This is separated into the east, west, and central sections of the city. This is based on our 1991 to 1993 historic survey. So last time we spoke about the need for a new citywide survey because that survey is 30 years old and how it we got an estimate for $2.3 million to conduct that survey over a period of about five years. So we know that we need to update this survey. We need to find the best way to do that, probably grant funding or finding other elements that we can that we can target. But the way that we've used that survey is we've taken it and we've gone through the hundreds of properties that were identified and really listed out whether or not they are of a priority to the city whether or not they should be locally designated, part of a district, nationally designated, et cetera. And we use this ongoing list to generate that 2023 priority list. So this priority list is based on that larger document, and you can pass that out, based on that larger document and kind of sets the tone for the next year. So what, what, what are our budgeting priorities really? Because the way that we approach that with city council in the enabling ordinances for the city of Winona, there's a requirement to prepare a budget uh, in May and submit that for the next year and then also do an annual review. And so this, this Excel sheet operates as that background and that backstop. And when we're looking at it today, what I wanna check in on is, does it reflect what we talked about over the last session or two sessions? And some of the things that you mentioned previously frankly, just aren't, re aren't reflected. Uh, one of the themes that really came out a whole bunch, and Jennifer, you really kept hearkening on this in the last meeting, or hearkening back to it, is education, education, education. And if we look at our, at our ongoing projects and other elements, we do have the financial education and outreach plan, which is in its second stage of work. But other than that, there really isn't another education component. We primarily use, historically, we've used this list more as an upcoming eligibility and nomination list and not so much as an education list. So in, in considering that, let's take a look at what these priorities are. Are there any initial thoughts aside from that education component? And Jennifer, feel free to jump in and say, Luke, you're nailing it with the education comment. More education is needed. Absolutely. Education and outreach. What, what else do we have here? What feels good? What feels like it's reaffirming? What We don't have to limit it just to things that are missing. Talk to me about what, what feels good about this list. I guess I just have a question for clarification purposes here. Um, on the middle section, we have National Register of Historic Places nominations needed. Can we clarify, or at least for me anyways, what will take for a nomination? Is it just someone off the street or someone on the city council? Yeah, so I, I should have clarified that and I appreciate that. So the 
first section here is eligibility determinations needed. So there's a two-step process. You have to determine a property to be eligible. And then after it has been determined to be eligible, it can be nominated. And the National Register of Historic Places nomination needed section are already buildings that have been determined as eligible. So you'll note the asterisks after that after that section and down at the bottom, that those were determined as eligible with the Winona Bridge study in 2010 and 2011. And actually they probably should be moved to eligibility determinations needed because that study is now 10 years old. And while SHPO, the State Historic Preservation Office might give us some leeway on that, typically once things have reached about 10 years old, um, it's anticipated that changes have occurred and other elements and a new eligibility determination should be done. It's again, one of the reasons why having a 30 year citywide survey is a problem. It just doesn't track it. So those have already been determined as a priority amongst that larger list by the HPC. There was a push to really focus on churches. Hence why those three are all churches. Uh, and First Baptist Church in particular at 368 West 6th Street was, or is actually in the Wyndham Park local historic district, but it was actually not determined to be contributing to the national district. And so we know that we'd like to put it on the National Register. It is individually eligible. It just wasn't eligible within that district. So just to follow up then, I mean, so in our last 2007 survey, correct, that these three churches qualified for National Registry, right? And they qualified under the 2010-2011 Winona Bridge study, yes. Okay, so at that time, why didn't or how, what needed to happen for a nomination? Frankly, uh, there was a lot of work to be done. Uh, so this list, uh, the HPC really only gets one item off this list a year or every other year. Um, the next budget proposal for city council is a request for $2,000 to do what's listed under other projects needed, uh, which is the Wyndham Park residential guidelines. And that would be $2,000 used as matching funds for a total $10,000 project. So even though this list is large and that other list is even larger, historically, there has not been significant city financial investment or time investment and able to go forward and do all of these projects. Uh, Luke, one of the buildings on here is 111 Riverfront. I thought 111 Riverfront was in the local historic district and must have been determined eligible. Wasn't that one of the things that was added after that district was created? So here, I'm going to share my screen to a different element here. Uh, so in 2018, we did do a we did do a study map for potential expansions of the historic districts or um, combinations of the two downtown historic districts. And 111 Riverfront, which is located here on the screen, uh, is a property that was determined as eligible way back in 1989. Um, I believe that the HPC attempted to put it on the National Register or local register in 1990, and it, the, the process just faltered for some reason. Uh, the documentation quite literally in my office just ends. Uh, and when we did this study in 2017, 2018, it was determined to be part of what we called the first phase of expansion of the East 2nd Street Commercial Historic District focused on industrial properties a little bit further beyond the existing boundary of the East 2nd Street um, Historic District. And that property, of course, would be a contributing property to that district. Where this created a problem is this first boundary expansion was rejected um, by the State Historic Preservation Office when we tried to create that amendment. Um, and so what we ended up doing was amending, and I'm gonna share my screen again, the Winona Commercial Historic District to include 102 Walnut and 159 East Second in the Winona Commercial Historic District and leaving the East Second Street Commercial Historic District alone. What was their reason for rejecting it? They did not like the incongruous boundaries with the additional parking lot, for example, and then also jumping across the street kitty corner here to include these. They also questioned, and I'll go back to that map, they also questioned why it would be divided into two, oh, that's the same map, my apologies. 
why it should be divided into two different processes. So like I mentioned, there was a phase one in the blue and a phase two in the red. And the reason why that phase two and phase one was divided was because we felt that it was going to be more difficult to include all of base state's properties, for example, in a new historic district. And since this time, the Park Brewery building located here at 72 Walnut Street has been demolished, and raised and replaced, and probably will not allow that full district to ever be realized because that was kind of a linchpin connecting that more industrial riverfront component. A couple other thoughts here is, uh, you know, there's nothing in here yet about the East End uh, lumber workers, shotgun houses. And, and you know, there, I know that the, I remember the initial survey of the city did not find one block that had, that hadn't been messed up, put it that way. But there's still opportunities, I think some pretty good opportunities with some areas of some blocks, if not a whole block of uh, some of that housing being designated locally at least. And the other thought I have is, I don't really see anything on here that I can I consider threatened. And I'm wondering if there's some buildings that maybe should have a higher priority that are threatened. And this is, might be a really bad example, but one is the what used to be the old Eagle Hotel, which I'm sure is threatened. It's where the Winona Monument Company was down there across from the courthouse. That little, it's a little two-story building that was the Eagle Hotel at one time was, you know, I don't think we have any hotels left from, and one time we had a lot of those kind of hotels downtown the area. And, you know, that's just one example, but I don't see anything on here that really looks threatened. Certainly the First Baptist Church and a lot of these older homes on here are, I think, pretty safe. So that's just an observation. I guess one question I had is what are some of the reasons that only like one or even less can be um, put forward in nomination application? I know they're very extensive, so I'm guessing it's money and time. I think that that's a, a good point. Um, I also think that there isn't a clear direction set by the comprehensive plan. Uh, that's saying, where I was going. <laughs> saying, hey, there should be two or three of these a year, or yeah. there should be paired education and individual. Right. Um, but I would defer, of course, to this subcommittee to tell me that yeah, so I can write that, it down and that, put it in That's things. where I was going with that loaded question. <laughs> Could you make it a priority in the new document to <laughs> have the city provide funding, staff, and goals? that should be met annually for historic designations based on maybe priority of their condition, loss, and then fold in some education of those business, those business or building owners in those locations. I had to sneak that in. <laughs> so what I'm hearing from that, from that priority suggestion is to suggest here, as we take a look at crafting goals and objectives over the next two months, really focusing on there should be an expanded effort to find those properties that may be threatened and use that kind of as our starting list to begin to move toward designation opportunities. Additionally, I heard you would like additional staff capacity in order to address that. Is that correct? Okay. You should. I mean, it sounds like that's a huge need internally or funding to contract with somebody who has the abilities to fill out one of these applications because I know it takes extensive research and mm -hmm. knowing how to write these. And then also I heard you didn't see any education really focused here on that priority list and so you'd like to really see more education paired in there as well. Well I think it's an opportunity during the process to bring in the owner of that property as an educational component and learn what this means and what that's all about. I think so. Do the other members of the subcommittees feel similarly? Um, Luke, I think that having a list of properties is important. And I think that 
designating them as individual sites certainly does a, a big part toward preservation. Um, but I think limiting ourselves to properties and even areas that are designated, especially when we're thinking about education is short-sighted. Um, I think that in the comprehensive plan, there should definitely be more capacity for um, educating whole city and certainly areas that are part of historic districts and areas on how special their area is and why. Jacob, I want to thank you for joining us here. It looks like you've unmuted. Go right ahead. I was just going to say, uh, I may have misunderstood, but if the suggestion was to set a benchmark, a yearly or a benchmark that must be achieved for designating new properties within a certain time, I get nervous about we have to have designations, so we're forced to designate things that we may not necessarily really want and how property owners or community members might see that. But if I was wrong in hearing that, no worries. I think that that's a, an interesting and a good point. Um, do we have a quota to fill? And if we do, are we going to not be targeting the best properties or are we going to be focusing more on individual nominations than necessarily funneling money toward education? Mark, it looks like you had something to say. Well, I don't disagree with that statement. It's just, I think that we have so much to do that we're a long ways from worrying about that right now. You know, if we, cause I mean, at best we're talking about probably doubling the number we do every year. And I mean, we have a list here that's good for the next 20 years. So um, I, 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 that wouldn't be a big concern of mine. Yeah, agreed too. And I, I think it's more of empowering city staff or the city to hire somebody to do, do more because just looking at the list and knowing what it takes, like Mark said, it, this is decades worth of work. I'm going to go back to that list just so we all have it up on the screen. Um, and yeah, looking at this, and we described that process earlier a little bit, you know, these first 15 items theoretically would be at least two years of work per item. And if you did three a year, you're looking at a minimum of 10 years. Yep. Jacob, I see you're unmuted. Oh, I'll, I'll remute. I was hoping you'd continue the conversation. It was a natural lull. No, I, it, it's fine. I've got no problem. Um, if, if, the, if the intent is to keep, and this may be because I came in late, but if the intent is that we're tied to this list that's already been designated and we're trying to tick off the different properties here, I, I see no problem with that. I don't, I don't think there would be an issue, like Mark said, within the next... 10 or 20 years, we'll go through a few more comp plans before then. But uh, th then would we tie in some requirement of when a new survey has to be completed to update this list? Or can we leave that nebulous? That is an excellent suggestion. Um, and I think that what we did, talked about right when you were arriving, I think, Jacob, is about 10 years is when a survey or a determination gets stale. So you have to act basically within those 10 years. Otherwise, things move from this national register nomination needed section back into this eligibility determination needed section. And I think that there is a timeliness component there. Um, I would humbly suggest to this committee that 30 years is a really long time to wait between your surveys. Um, the the certified local government status that the city maintains, which does allow us to apply for many more grants and many more projects to be achieved, is tied to having timely survey data and updated surveys. Uh, some of that obviously has been done. You know, we did a survey of our two downtown districts. We've done a survey of Wyndham Park. And recently, MnDOT thankfully came in and did the bridge survey. 
but those are a small collection of our total thousands upon thousands of properties. So Jacob, if you were to propose a time, I think now would be a great time to suggest that into your microphone. I've never given it thought as to how long. So I, I don't know that I'm ready to propose a timeline. You're saying, am I on? You're saying that um, really the survey is the first thing because a lot of these things have gone stale. Yeah, so actually, if we look here at the survey studies needed section, you know, we have that last survey completed for the full citywide survey in 1993. And as I mentioned, you know, we're just required to maintain that status to have updated surveys. Doesn't necessarily have to be a full citywide survey, though a lot of the conversation in the preservation field, and particularly in the redevelopment field, who use tax credits and rely on these surveys in order to achieve national register status to get to those tax credits. Um, are suggesting that, hey, communities need to remember that a 30-year-old survey just isn't good enough anymore. Um, there was a lot of work done in the 1980s for cities to really kind of get their first citywide surveys done, but a lot of cities just haven't had the capacity or the time um, necessarily to go forward and do them again. Uh, so theoretically, you could do individual, you know, government institution district on 4th Street, Broadway conservation, or local designation district. I should remove the word conservation based on our conversation last time um, or these other individual surveys, but it'd be piecemeal um, is what is kind of the takeaway there. But my question, I guess, is that if they expire after 10 years and you can only really get to nominating and that process so many at a time, why not do it piecemeal so that you can actually achieve bits at a time instead of having to come back and resurvey 30 years later. Definitely a, a good strategy to consider. Absolutely. I'm not sure what priority I'd pick. I would <laughs> I would count on those who have been here a little longer than me, but which which districts are would be a priority. Can we leave that to city staff to determine what the highest, I, I'm just worried that priorities change. So if we identify a priority list in this document in five years, is that priority list still the most endangered or the most priority uh, district or research? Luke, um... Do you think that's our job, or do you think that should be the job of the HPC itself? I think that not the HPC or. So. I think that's a good suggestion from Jacob, and I think that's a good question to ask. Is yeah, maybe it is left up to the HPC. Um, I, that's where I think it should yep. be myself. And maybe the the language we use here is more directing that timely surveys need to be done, and then the follow up work needs to be done within a set period of time. I'm seeing some head nods. People feel okay about that. Jessica looks like she might want to add something. No? Okay. I appreciate that. I will draw our attention, and, and Mark, you touched on this a little bit before. You know, a lot of the properties here are primarily those of wealthy individuals, prominent buildings. They're not the East End day laborer homes. And equity is one of those conversations, or one of those key themes throughout our comprehensive plan. Are we doing ourselves a disservice by not saying that we should be prioritizing those types of projects, looking at things like deed restrictions or looking at things like day laborer um, historic districts focused on shotgun homes, for example? Any thoughts related to that? Particularly those of you in the preservation field and the whiteness of preservation in particular or the lack of immigrant communities that are represented in many different districts or anything else that I might spitball and need confirmed by a subcommittee to say out loud. <laughs> kind of mixed feelings on that because of the requirements that come with putting properties on the National Register. A lot of times poor people today are living in small homes and then you're putting requirements on those. Yeah, I, it's, that's a tricky one. It's today, um, we do wanna preserve those stories from the past, but they also aren't big 
wealthy homeowners today who are are then going to be subject to restrictions. If there are ways to help with those things and educate all this stuff that would incentivize those people to have their homes preserved, um, I think that'd be really useful if, if we're going to do that. Right. And I think, yeah, that last part of that is, you know, when I mean, we talked about it at our last meeting too, is, you know, how are there ways we can make being historic property owner easier and have the benefits outweigh the restrictions, um, if that's even possible locally. <laughs> I'm confused about what being on the National Register means because I owned a home that was and there were no restrictions. So there is a difference between local and national, right? That is correct. Yeah, being on the National Register won't come with restrictions on what you can do with your property. Being on the local register will is that regulatory arm. That is correct. Any other thoughts related to that type of impact on our communities or sections of our communities if we were to pursue those types of projects. I think maybe there would be hopefully an increase in perceived value of these members of the community who own these types of historic properties. You know, history is not just the big grand giant courthouse, it's also the shotgun houses you know, or the, you know, the oddball, um, Lutron, Lustron, Lust Mark Help, <laughs> Lustron, you know, these, you know, we have a couple here um, that are unique that way. And just, um, and I think it would bring, you know, a little bit more equality and raising the value of that and, you know, saying, hey, you're important. You know, you don't have to be rich and famous to be important. Are any of the Lustron houses already designated in town? As far as I am aware of, no. Okay. And we don't individually name residences, do we? We'd rather it be in a district. Uh, we do do some residences. Uh, we have residences that are on the local register that are not on the national register. And we have some residences that are on the national register that are not on the local register as well. Okay. Right now, I forget how many Lustron homes there are. I mean, there is Mugby's Coffee on Mankato Avenue and Menard. So that, that's a Lustron home. There's mm -hmm. one out behind Sugarloaf. And I know there's one across from the old Minnesota City School. And there might be one more, but those are the three I remember. But yeah, they should be appreciated, if nothing else. They're a dying breed, that's for sure. They are. Well, what is it you're speaking of as an architect? A Lustron home, after, right after World War II, there was such a shortage for housing that the uh, there's a, a guy in, a, in his company, and I can't remember the whole story real well, but and I think it was in Ohio, and he started building these erector set homes. They were maintenance-free homes. The interior, exterior was all baked enamel. And I mean, you, you just, in, they, they were all numbered. And he made a couple thousand of them, 2,500 of them or something around the country. And we have three here locally. And uh, there's a whole movie about it. If you Google Lustron Homes, you can see this movie. But he got into a, 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 some kind of an argument with some pencil head out, out of Washington, D.C. And the guy uh, uh, sort of screwed him over. And the guy, I think, went bankrupt or something because he wouldn't, he wouldn't uh, do what this guy wanted him to do. And he wouldn't compromise his integrity, I think. So he uh, went out of business. But... They, they were they were a, a really good answer to the housing shortage at the time, and they they were maintenance free. The, all the cabinets inside the house, everything was just you know washable, and exterior was all you had to do was wash it once in a while. Um, Luke, I wanted to add two things. The first is that especially as we're talking about. Um, 
areas of lower income housing or of populations that are in the minority of Winona or nationally, um, designation and restriction does not have to be the same as outreach. So as Jennifer is talking about things like perceived value, I think that if our recommendation is for more education, maybe in the comprehensive plan moving forward, the HPC's purpose is defined as dual, not just primarily designating districts and buildings, but also it's the job of the HPC and it's the job of the city by supporting funding and city staff to do those outreach projects and education and communicating that value to Winona and Minnesota and the larger area. Um, the second thing I wanted to bring up is I know in our earlier meetings, indigenous populations were brought up and kind of the lack of some of our traditional historic preservation tools in Winona to connect with those communities and that history. And I just wanna be sure as we're talking about goals, objectives moving forward that we bring it up again and that it gets on the right list. Okay, into the microphone. <laughs> Right into the microphone. That's exactly where that list lives. Correct. That's a really good comment. Um, and, and those comments underrepresented or typically underserved in terms of in terms of our existing tools and projects. Those are really those are really important. And if we look back at that list that we have in front of us, uh, you know, we don't see a lot of that coming through necessarily. It hasn't necessarily been the typical. Uh, approach and you know to Mark's point, there is a lot to do, um, but there's definitely room to to expand and make sure that that scope is reflective of all of Winona, regardless of of that initial background. Absolutely. Any other initial thoughts or or continuing thoughts here related to priorities and projects and really what we're kind of circling around is, is overall scope, both scope in terms of size, but also scope in terms of who's responsible, right? And we're hearing, you know, we want to see the HPC take more of an education role. Uh, and one of the things that was mentioned last time was partnerships. You know, can we partner beyond just the historical society who we love very much, but also with the Chamber of Commerce and with Main Street more closely? Uh, any thoughts related to setting priorities related to that? Was there, a, I, you know, I, I was around and on the commission at when the citywide windshield survey was done. But I don't, and you know, I know there's probably boxes of documents from that. But was there a summary report that was done that maybe we should see and have a, a kind of a better sense of what that survey said? Yeah, um, we can definitely bring that back to you. Uh, absolutely, it is three we, different we sections. We haven't been given it yet. Have no, we, we haven't. Um, we do use it primarily as background reference material, but it isn't. It's old. <laughs> it is, I know it is. Yeah. But it's all we got. Really. It, it is. Yeah, it is, is. It is our most comprehensive in terms of, of uh, alignment for the entire city. And it was east, west, central. Um, but yeah, I can happily bring that back to all of us. But I think that'd be a good discussion topic for us. So related to education, I think what I'm hearing is I'd like to bring back um, for our next meeting as well is we have the 2015 education plan that was created for the HPC, but never really followed up on. Um, and really, I think maybe we could we could work our way through that and say, you know, what, what was a good goal based on what we've talked about and what really didn't quite hit home and what, what didn't we accomplish, which I think might be a, a solid chunk of that plan. Um, so we can talk about why didn't we accomplish those things? Were there barriers? Do we feel that there are barriers? Does this group in particular, because it's made up of only two HPC members and a whole host of people from the community perceive barriers that perhaps we didn't see back at that time period? Um, so I think that that would be a good thing for us to bring back as well. I wanna circle back onto one element here um, that Jacob, I believe that you brought up and it was about individual homes and maybe focusing more on districts instead. And I think that that's an important division because sometimes you might have properties that are eligible individually um, or just only as part of a district because they just don't have the integrity to be individually. And um, taking a look at our, our baseline report here that we will be, this is in draft mode, um, that we will be integrating into 
the beginning of the comprehensive plan. These are those three districts that we have in the city of Winona. We have Wyndham Park here in yellow. That's from 2021. It's primarily residential. We have the Winona Commercial Historic District that was established in the 1990s and the East 2nd Street Commercial Historic District. And these two, their background information go back to about 1989. Um, and Wyndham Park was relatively recent. It's starting with that bridge study and then local designation in 2016. But if we look back at the overall National Register Historic Property sites across the city of Winona, they are pretty scattered. Uh, you know, we have things like random industrial properties. Well, not random, uh, historically significant industrial properties, but properties that are not really tied to another district and were placed on the register a number of years ago. And we also have properties that are really quite closely associated, similar to those districts. And I, I want to maybe tease out from this group should we be focusing on more properties and districts and trying to find those cohesive wholeness, particularly as we talk about themes amongst different peoples in Winona? Is that seeming more of a priority than targeting the individual properties it is kind of what I want to tease out from this group. If we are to set a direction and the HPC operates as kind of that implementation arm, what is that direction that this subcommittee would like to go? Sadie, you are free to unmute if you would like to ask all of your questions. <laughs> would you like me to? Yeah, go right ahead. Okay, so some of these go back uh, a little bit further. Um, the first one was a thought on whether there should be any extra action taken at this point on properties that are not currently seen as threatened. Um, I just wanna offer up that uh, discussions around the peerless chain building were really emotional for a lot of people. Um, and there were some frustrations from city council members, from the community, from, I guess, from everyone. Um, and one of the comments that was made by a city council member is that uh, the Historic Preservation Commission was only chasing after proposed developments and they weren't being proactive. And so that member's choice to vote for no additional protections or requirements on that building as it was being renovated um, was meant to be a learning lesson for them. Um, and to, I guess, hope that there would be more, more movement um, on identifying these these buildings or what that kind of thing um and just so i i guess i worry that i worry about the view that a property might not be threatened right now um, just because of what happens once there is a proposal to renovate or uh, demolish and, and things um and then after that uh Thank you to Jacob. I had asked if there was any entity that currently holds any events or celebrations uh, or tours of historic properties. And he had said that there have been historic home tours or Christmas home tours, but doesn't know if they happen currently. Um, and I just wondered if, you know, a part of helping to celebrate those East End homes um, and, and the owners or tenants of those homes if if there is some kind of more community-wide celebration or tour of that area um and just proposing something along those lines if it if it might be a help um and the last one uh as we are talking about a lot of these these older homes um and incentives for keeping them up or renovations. Um, myself as a renter in town, I've lived in a few historic homes, one of which was a large, beautiful old Victorian that had been split up in kind of a weird way into at least five different multi-bedroom apartments. Um, and I'm currently in an old 1880s brick house on the East End. Um, and I've had a number of conversations with my current landlord about, um, you know, oh, it'd be so cool to upgrade this house, to add insulation, to 
renovate, to uh, restore some of the uh, elements that look like they've been taken down. Um, and he, uh, as, a, as a wonderful person, would also wish that he could do that, um, but it's just not within his budget to do all of those big things um, for a rental property. And uh, I may be an outlier, but if there were some kind of program, especially focused on um, you know, helping landlords who own historic properties to help renovate them, I, as a tenant, would be elated to be a part of that process, to learn more about the history of my own dwelling that I'm in, and to help restore those even in some of my spare time. Thank you. Those are some phenomenal comments. I think that Jennifer Weaver would like to respond maybe to tours of historic homes. Yes. Yeah. Good questions. Um, of course, COVID has kept us from having the Christmas house tour the past few years, but for at least over 30 years, if not even approaching over 40 at this point, there's been either an annual or uh, every other year historic home tour um, around Christmas time. Um, that kind of marries the history of the home, as well as, you know, decorating for Christmas for those who might not be as big of, of history buffs. Um, and then other just kind of one-off events um, here and there from various tours um, and people opening their homes for events and things like that, like Chocolate Shakespeare and Champagne was held at the Alexander Mansion and other places, but um, also our guides um, for these boat cruises and other bus companies as well as our walking tours that are public and for private bookings do talk about um, like the shotgun houses um, and other, you know, historic properties on these tour routes. So yes. <laughs> and then um, I think just to reiterate, I think we kind of talked a little bit about at, at our last meeting too is, you know, there's like, you know, it's difficult because there are historic properties that have known historic significance, either in their architecture or the stories of the people who built them or lived there. But there are just simply old places that are cool, but might not qualify for this level of care. So I think there should be kind of a tier at some point, if possible, or as a goal maybe of both in the education realm of the owner of that property, but also if there's any possibility of a fund where Maybe you're not on the register and don't get those tax credits, but maybe a grant or some sort of community funding to help out with what you just talked about. So I think money is really everything when it comes to hit, you know any property. Erin, would you mind sharing a little bit of the the residential plan that you brought to the HPC and the the incentive for those homeowners and motivation for that kind of preservation? Because I want to reiterate what. Um, Sadie said about landlords and the rental properties in Minnesota too, and kind of what the motivation might be um, to upkeep those historic properties too. Yeah, so recently uh, it was proposed in the HPC to kind of adopt, not adopt, but model after a program that another city in Minnesota, Stillwater has, is called heirloom and landmark sites. So basically any property that does not fit inside a neat boundary of a conservation or historic district, but still has individual uniqueness, heritage, integrity, they, the city of Stillwater went through and with some studies and surveys, uh, qualified certain properties individually as, an heirloom house or a landmark site. And I think that's kind of similar to what we're talking about right now is even though it doesn't fit inside of a neat little boundary area, um, it can still be qualified to receive some sort of protection and or you know possible, I don't know the details yet, but if there is any grant money available to help those homeowners with basic exterior maintenance, I don't know. to just recognize those properties and homeowners too is significant and creating some kind of a list that you can go on and say, oh, my house, this is 
my house is cool it's on this list you can go on the website and look at it i would assume that the, right exactly yeah. it doesn't have to be formal is what carrie says i see a future story map totally has there been any conversation about doing anything with people's property taxes if they invest more and maybe the city and the county working together i mean that would be an incentive for any rental person i mean if i could put in five thousand dollars worth of improvements and drop my property taxes a couple hundred bucks a year or something i don't know it might be something and i don't know if you've had that conversation i don't know if any other cities Luke, do you know if anybody's doing that kind of thing? We can definitely look into it. And I think that's a good suggestion to consider. Yeah. I was going to circle back on a comment about district versus individual housing. I think the Lustron versus the shotgun houses sort of plays out my indecision about whether there should be direction to the HBC in terms of pursuing one over the other in that the shotgun houses are all clustered together and create more easily a district but it sounds like the Lustron houses we have in town are possibly in three different corners and are individual properties and so I don't I don't know that a blanket direction in defining district versus property makes a whole lot of sense depending on what we're targeting. Yeah, I would agree with that as well. But I think one of the things that um, was talked about in the HBC regarding the heirloom and landmark sites is obviously we need a certain population density to qualify for a district or a neighborhood. Right. But then as soon as that neighborhood district gets more diluted, there's only a couple here and there, then at that point we could look at naming individual properties, even if the neighborhood does not qualify. So I agree with you, I think there's room for both. Are are we aware uh, specifically about the shotgun houses? I've never really considered those um in my free time but uh in the wider either regional or national the shotgun houses are tiny workforce housing and they're never going at least i've never seen them as desirable with current living standards unless you start combining or adding on to or changing them so that they lose their sort of shotgun massing and layout. Has there ever been a program or development where someone comes in and is able to purchase multiple shotgun properties in an area and start uh, creating sort of a either affordable housing or low income or something where a developer would have a larger pot of finance to support maintaining their heritage versus relying on um, the homeowner who's living in a, a property that they may be trying to save up so they can get out of, which they don't have incentive then to reinvest in maintaining a historic heritage of the house. I just, I don't know if there's ever been anything creative to try to save shotgun workforce housing. Uh, I'm, you know, that's been a dream of mine for a long time that somebody would step in and buy up a couple of blocks and just, you know, show what can be done with those homes. And, and uh, I've been fortunate and my son lives in New Orleans and you go down to New Orleans and if anybody spent any time down there, I mean, boy, I mean, that's, you know, shotgun houses on in steroids down there and they're beautiful and they're valued and, and appreciated. And, and they really, they have, uh, you know, a lot of desirability and the whole neighborhoods have been restored and fixed up. And, you know, there's, you know, there's, we, we have that too, that, that potential, I think. And it's, it's an under appreciated potential, I think, in Winona. Just throwing that out.
It's also kind of the economic brilliance of these laborers in, you know, the lumber mills and elsewhere of they couldn't afford a whole lot. So they would buy half lot and split it up. So it's also kind of a lesson in economic development for lower income communities. So yeah, I think it'd be awesome to give Shine a little bit more light on that. I'm going to add one comment and then I'm going to maybe talk about ending our session here today, but that also plays into the historic development pattern of Winona. It's something that our land use subcommittee is also talking about right now is how can we help replicate that more, not necessarily shotgun homes, but smaller lots in general um, and get higher returns on public investment, like public infrastructure, like streets and water and sewer, et cetera, because you have more homes of, of maybe even not necessarily the highest value, but many more of them on a value per acre basis, it really shoots right up. Um, so it is 1220, well, almost 1225. I do want to uh, make sure that we have the time to talk about meeting at our next meeting. And Sadie just added a couple of comments about how we could use students. Um, the Accessible Government Subcommittee wants to use students to promote more story mapping in the city of Winona, have a student um, internship process, as well as recommending uh, Chuck Marone's concept of thickening neighborhoods naturally through small investments like more shotgun houses or accessory dwelling units, etc. Things that can help people invest more money in their homes so that they shine and they continue on for many more years. But let's go ahead and turn our attention to our next meeting date. I'd like us to be able to meet potentially two weeks out is July 8th, maybe over the lunch hour and an amenable time for this group. I'm getting one no already. Is it primarily the 8th or the lunch time issue? The 8th. Okay, could we do the 15th? Bring me a birthday cake. All right, 15th with birthday cake or another surprise for Jessica. All right, we will plan on the 15th at 1130, if that's fine with everybody. Perfect. Well, thank you all very much for your time. Our next session will focus on that education component, and we'll also bring back some of those documents for you to look back on from the 1990s. And with that, we'll go ahead and end today. Thank you very much for your thoughts.